and welcome to another Comics Burst from the Full Force podcast, sponsored by Distant Planet Comics and Collectibles, where we take an in-depth look at the newest G.I. Joe comics and related titles of the week, with me as your host, Chris. Wish I'd taken the clocks going forward into consideration, my cloud, <laughs> aka Diagnostic 80. Joining me on this episode is Brian, makes me get up far too early for this sh- Hickey. On this, <laughs> on this instalment of your absolutely favourite kind of burst, we continue our catch-ups with the G.I. Joe A Real American Hero yearbook. So without further ado, let's get stuck into this comics burst. Recap the explosive year that was with an all-new Dawn Moreno slash Snake Eyes adventure from living legend Larry Hammer and superstar artist Kay Zama. Backed up by an original G.I. Joe A Real American Hero short story by fan favourite writer Tommy Lee Edwards and artist David Jean Felice, the special oversized issue is chock full of extras for old and new G.I. Joe A Real American Hero fans alike. So then, Brian, thank you for jumping on this early. Well, I say this early. It's early for me. It's like the middle of the day for you. But um, five a.m. I can't believe <laughs> I did not take into consideration the clocks going forward. I get up like an extra hour early, and I'm like, it's like you know, I don't know. It was, it was early, and then, <laughs> and I'm like, Brian, are you ready to go? I hope the fans out there appreciate this awesome commitment. Exactly from Chris. AKA Diagnostic Aidy McLeod <laughs> and the rest of us full four sh- schmooze bags. <laughs> I get I tell you what, I tell you what, it's a good <laughs> job I needed to poop so early this morning because I would have I wouldn't have made it. Um anyway, dude, let's get into okay. this let's get into this yearbook. Before we start, let's let's talk about so I think from now on we should start with the cover and just move forward because my bloody goodness, K Zama's cover is just unreal, isn't it? I'm actually speechless. I mean, this is beautiful. It is beautiful. I mean, we throw that word around a bit, but this is beautiful. Paddy has been bigging up K Zama a lot. If anyone follows Paddy on on uh, you know Facebook or Twitter, he's been highlighting her work quite a bit and basically putting out the call that that she should have her own uh joe comic here here totally got to back that up and when you see the the obviously we're just focused on the cover right now but it's just action-packed and awesome and it's just be- and it's just a it's a beautiful simple pose yeah but packed with so much energy and movement the six pack the look at the detail on the six pack as well and like the just everything about this like the hair like the individual strands kind of like you know, it's not like one of those things where you see like the comic hair and it's just all like, you know, one piece kind of thing. You can really see individual strands in the hair and just the just everything is on point here. Like the the detail on that mask on the visor, uh, the, the all of the different elements like the, the straps and the pouches and all that kind of stuff, all that all the detail in the clothing and everything. It's just exceptional. And then on the hilt, on the sword, is even like a design on there, which is just gorgeous. Beautiful, a beautiful piece of, of illustration and design work on that. I mean, I don't know if we've seen a design on the hilt of Don Moreno's sword before, but certainly for Kazama to give that some consideration is, is I mean, this is lovingly illustrated. It's the only way to describe it. Yeah, totally. Real attention to detail as well. Even the way the belt is kind of tucked in yeah. under the... Um, that kind of like strap which folds back on itself kind of thing. Yeah, it's, totally. Oh. Yeah. And, and I, I love Kazama's signature. Yeah, it's cool, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. KZ, that's, that's beautiful. I actually had a couple of prints signed by Kazama for Paddy while, while we were out in uh, TF Nation and yeah, the, the, the her work is just next level like the trans the stuff she's done on transformers is beautiful as well like she really does i mean a great job on this book so getting into the first panel something i wanted to point out immediately because obviously dawn is visiting granny and the arashikagi clan in the east village and uh, the first panel kind of shows what we will later see as a spy drone from revanche which is kind of in and around a bunch of kind of Transformer-esque robotic action figures. And tucked away in the image on there is a teal green G1 Bumblebee figure, which I think is such a cute touch. (laughs) I love that. And obviously, you know, tying in with the universe a little bit there uh, in, in a... In a nice, cute way. Just gonna say the articulation on that um, drone, that Revanche drone, is is a total giveaway. 
It's uh, <laughs> so totally many, out of sync. So many points of articulation on that, yeah. <laughs> Clearly not a, a Takara or Hasbro produced <laughs> toy. <laughs> but, definitely um, an, definitely a, a third party knockoff for sure. What was funny is when I first read this, I was drawn to that one a little bit. I kind of, I was kind of immediately I started looking at the toys on that that shelf, and obviously the fact that it's blue and it's got that camo on it, I instantly thought blue ninjas. So I think that's obviously done on purpose. You know, we we basically get her visiting Granny, having the little back and forth, and then while they're talking, they're kind of whispering to each other, saying, "Yep." Uh, we've both noticed what's what's on the shelf don't make any sudden movements don't let it be known kind of thing but then all of a sudden it realizes it's being compromised and it kind of tries to escape and that's when they a granny grabs a handbag and just m- mashes it to the, to the to the wall with her brick in a handbag weapon granny's signature move which i absolutely love is brilliant this is again just over these first couple of pages, the artwork is, I think it's its lovingly done. Yep. You have that, you know, the beautiful attention, attention to detail. And obviously you mentioned the G1 Bumblebee in there. You know, lots of action straight out at, at, at the bash with Granny's signature move. And uh, she ultimately destroys the, completely destroys the drone, including its self-destruct mechanism. Yeah. But not before it's able to take a final shot of Don Moreno in her kind of standard military gear her beret and uniform i like that look by the way that's a really cool alternate look for her isn't it do you know what i'd love to see some action figures like that yeah you know, uh, you know, officially produced figures i'm sure we, we could do a few um customs but i think that would be a great look for, for a don moreno action figure big time of course that that last image is transmitted right back to you know the, the, the base of operations where the drone is being you know controlled from and that's when it's revealed that this is uh you know the blue ninjas it's revenge and this picks up pretty much for issue 259 left off yeah and and obviously we're introduced now to a couple of uh (laughs) names that will stick with you um (laughs) we get bnx 0066 who is the kind of surveillance operative kind of like human based style revanche droid but then we also get introduced to bnz 001 sorry bnz i'm not going to start saying z bnz 001 which is a giant revanche spider droid which is, I actually think looks really terrifying. Like it's very, yeah. it's very Ghost in the Shell, oh. very standalone complex Ghost in the Shell stuff. So, uh, if you've ever seen that that kind of either the films or the the series, they have very similar. Although they're kind of like good droids and they've they've come like childlike, but in this one, obviously, it's just a terrifying spider. <laughs> and uh, even the way when it's when we first see it. The way it's drawn, like it's it's leaning to one side, like it's oh, you know, it's like it's kind of clambering into the room. Scary. It's just oh, and it, it's it's coming up on uh, or you know, it's, it's coming up behind. Was it BNX zero zero six six? Yeah, this is going to be hard saying all these names. <laughs> no, I wrote them down because I thought, you know what, we're going to be saying this a lot now, aren't we? <laughs> but, and, and so yeah, so we find out at this stage that they're putting the Arashikage clan under surveillance because they they feel that they're the biggest threat to revanche, or at least one of the biggest threats to revanche. So they want to know what they're up to. So we get this kind of series of different, smaller and smaller and smaller surveillance droids being kind of sent in. But before that happens, we, we swing back to the East Village, and Jinx is introduced um, again. So we, we get to see Jinx, but she's in her civvies. And something, again, I noticed on her jacket, she's got two tiger heads on her jacket, on, a, on the front of her jacket. The two tiger heads, I think, is an homage to her Tiger Force version and the recent FSS Club figure release. That That's what, ah. I'm, that's what I think is going on there. I think you're spot on. I think you're spot. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of any other kind of significance of the tiger heads, but that's if that's the case, if what you're saying is true, that's a lovely little homage going on right there. I'd love to think that's what it is, because, I mean, there's no other reason for that, I don't think, other than, you know, because she's been in Tiger Force. So, uh, and recently as well, with that kind of green and yellow figure version. And I say recently with the FSS that homage the 2003 version, I think it was. I could be wrong with the date, but don't hold me to that because I I hate having to remember dates off the top of my head. I should have written it down. We also get introduced to Raymond at this stage, who seems to be like a new Arashikage recruit that's being trained by Budo, as it's mentioned by Granny. Yeah, I'm not familiar. I haven't come across this Raymond character before, but obviously he's 
you know, he, he plays an important role later on in this story. I mean, the key thing here is that he's been trained by Budo and now he's kind of moved over to Granny Arashikage's plan, I presumably to kind of further his training. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 one of those things where it's a, it's a random character that's been introduced. I'm not 100% sure the reasoning behind it. I'd like to hear more about the backstory behind this introduction because, you know, something I loved about the G.I. Joe comics, especially the ones that Larry writes, is the, re- the the fact he goes into a lot of detail with the backgrounds and characters usually turn up for for a reason. They're not just kind of dropped in. Um, obviously, they were when there were toys involved, but in this case, he's kind of just all of a sudden we've got this random character appeared, and oh yeah, he's been training with Budo, and there's no mention of him in the past. I don't, not that I'm aware of, and it just feels like okay, well we'll see how it goes. And funnily enough, it's another blonde white male. Which I'm I'm wondering if we're going to get another Snake Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to call him Raymond Eyes from now on. Raymond Eyes or Ray Ray Eyes, which doesn't make any sense. One thing we can say about Larry Hammett is that he's he kind of plays a long game with these stories. Yeah, yeah. So this is there's, there's clearly there's some setup or introduction going on here, and I would expect that Larry will. We'll kind of flesh that out a little bit later on. So again, all I can assume is that this is going to tie back in with what we're seeing in issue two, five, nine, and the story that's going to unfold there. Yeah. So there'll be, I'm sure, there'll be plenty of opportunity to to detail out Raymond's background, and you know, will will he become a prime character, or will he be killed off for dramatic effect? We'll have to wait and see. Yeah. Um. And then we get the new revanche surveillance droid, which is a mouse. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a mouse, but it's still like a robot. So, I mean, that would stand out like a sore <laughs> for me. And it seems to, because the cat gets it, rags, attacks it, and <laughs> captures it. And then that's where Raymond shows his skills uh, with a sword. I love it when they when they show like a ninja using a sword, like cutting something really like low to the ground. And yet not touching the ground with the blade. I think that's, you know, really like that just shows the, the level of skill you're dealing with. And I think that's that's important. Yeah. Uh, that's not a mistake. That is, you know, showing that Larry Hammer and Keizawa giving us an indication of that this this guy Raymond, he's no slouch. He's he's a major player coming into the Arashikage clan. And then again we what we get now is like a key, like a switch back and forth from the Arashikage clan to the revanche facility that the the surveillance facility and now it's getting to the point where the the spider droid BNZ001 <laughs> is getting more and more uh, like annoyed and frustrated with the, uh, the the fact that the surveillance is failing and taking it out on BNX0066 and it's at this point where he goes right I've had enough you're going to be going in with a much much smaller drone which happens to be like a like a fly kind of size but because of the range capabilities he has to be close by in order to operate it so he has to put this kind of like skin mask on uh, like almost a human disguise which is i think is really cool and this this really again has got shades of ghost in the shell and the whole droid android human kind of relationship thing what i like here there's, there's a lot of dialogue back and forth between BNX006 and BNZ001. Well done. And well done. That was uh, that was brilliant. And um, <laughs> what they what they reveal is that BNX006 has had a lot of different upgrades into his system, so he's able to think for himself. Yeah. And and you know make decisions on the fly. But part of the what we can see here, part of the drawback from all these upgrades, is that he feels he feels under pressure from BNZ001 and uh, and you can even see as he's getting this kind of flesh tissue placed over his face his robotic face he looks really anxious and worried it's also interesting that he's kind of touching it in in like the, the way that he when the when the face is kind of applied to him you can see that he's feeling at it and like i don't know like starting to feel like he's becoming human in a weird way he's definitely a conflicted character he's not just a simple drone droid going through the motions and fought and carrying out kind of directives yeah he's he feels like he's trying to find his way in the world a little bit but under massive pressure from BNZ001 who's breathing down his neck the whole time. And again, we switch back to the East Village and the Water Tower, which has become synonymous with the Arashikage clan and has probably had so much damage to it in the past, I'm surprised it's still standing. It's probably like 
the 67th version of that water tower over the years <laughs> but the um they're all in there meditating i say they're all it's granny storm shadow jinx raymond and dawn the talent I know. The talent in that room. I know. I know. The <laughs> skill in that room is disgusting. And yeah, they're all kind of like chilling out. You, you can the next. There's a small panel that shows like a little green flash coming through the window, and that's obviously the the new small drone, the new little. Actually, it's not the window, is it? That's the trap floor. Door trap door. Sorry, oh, yeah. I apologise. So yeah, you can see it kind of coming through the trap door underneath, and then you see this series of face all all the different meditated states of each individual character close up their eyes close up and then the bug finally like there on show and then we see that it's being controlled by bnx 0066 and you know he's trying to get some close surveillance on it and everything and one thing leads to another and raymond is actually the one that notices initially and tries to swat it with his sword he's the first guy to to break concentration takes a slash and misses uh, of course, just rewinding really, really quickly, BNX006 is curious as to what's going on. He's he's actually, as the drone first starts to catch these characters, he's uh, reading these kind of um, whatever brainwaves, whatever signals the drone is picking up, he's reading that. And he says as if it's almost as if they're, they're asleep. And uh, BNZ001 explains that they're in this meditative state that almost allows them to replenish their energies. They make that kind of connection almost with how droids sometimes can recharge before they need to go back into action. Which is really cool. You know, it's a nice little kind of thing as these, I suppose, revanche is learning more and more about the human or the meat bags, as they call them, which I think is really funny as well. <laughs> God, yeah. But not only does Raymond miss trying to swat this fly, but um, Dawn has a, a couple of swipes and misses as well, and it's in Granny as well. She throws a handbag at it, which she loves doing. Even Jinx, yeah. She, and and it's what's nice here. Actually, we were critiquing. I think it was um, Silent Issue, where the dialogue, the speech bubbles, reveals too much about the story yeah, and what's yeah. going on. Yeah, Larry's a lot more economical with the dialogue in this sequence of events here, and it's only when Jinx misses. That we get, you know, the speech bubble that it's it's too small and impossible to hit. Which I thought that was a nice touch by Larry. So clearly he's been listening to the full force. <laughs> he's taken our critiques on board. Fair play, Larry. Really appreciate it. Uh, I, I sense sarcasm <laughs> in your tone there. But yeah, uh, the fact that Storm Shadow is the one that grabs it with very little effort. Like he just puts his finger out there, grabs it by the the wing, and is is just so bad. <laughs> that scene where he's got it in his hand and he's just like I never said Ray yeah I, I love that Zay's in his Zaz not is not over yet I love that <laughs> that's Mr. Miyagi going on right there big time and I love the fact that the you know you see the worry then again in BNX 0066's face <laughs> Got to think of a, an easier way to say that. I'm going to call him Bonks Ooks instead because that's so much easier to say. And then obviously with that, the, the spider droids had enough. BNZ001 sends backup in and that backup is Blue Death X86. <laughs> How bad <laughs> does this General oh. Grievous want to be look? <laughs> this is, yeah, this is so General Grievous Blue Death X86. I love it. Uh, it's like a giant version of... The drone we saw on the first panel. Yes. Pretty much, again, super articulated. So definitely not a Takara <laughs> or a Hasbro action figure. Um, can we get into trouble for saying that? Is that like really bad? No. <laughs> no one cares. <laughs> the, there are other people saying worse things. No, but I know, and, and let's face it, we know you're joking, Brian, so it's fine. But yeah, this I love the fact that he's got like the two helicopter blade things as well. So he's obviously flown in really quickly. And he's just like, you know, arms all over the place. You know, really cool design. You don't see a lot of him. You know, it's it's always kind of like certain angles and stuff like that, which is, is pretty cool. Kind of leads you to, I don't know, kind of a bit, a bit more mysterious and a bit scary. He's like, okay, well, now we finish meditating. I can cut this fly in half, lets it go and cuts it with his sword which is pretty amazing and then but then realizes there's another threat coming and that's when <laughs> and that's when we see this incredible panel with what well, I, I love the fact that one of his arms the x86 the blue death x86 is kind of like they're used to kind of like supplant to kind of like create almost like a tripod so that he can then fire this huge gatling gun 
into the water tower and he just absolutely decimates the water tower and you think oh shit. I love his line before he opens fire. He looks to uh, BNX0066 and goes, watch and learn. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, he lets rip and completely decimates the, the the water tank, climbs up into the space. I'm not sure who says it, but somebody says, well, up here, Twinkle Toes. I'm thinking Storm Shadow because it's then him, it's Storm Shadow that then jump, jumps down to attack him. And yeah, I would, I would probably... Uh, and and you can see like from the silhouette that you can see kind of storm shadows kind of split toe kind of shoe i think as it's been said so i'm going to i'm going to go ah, out and say yes. i think it's plus you've also got the dot 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 after that after that and then the next speech bubble is storm shadow so i'm i'm going to go ahead and say it's storm shadow you know and he, he informs us and blue death x86 that a rotary cannon is useless without an ammo feed and our arashikagi ninja go straight into the, the process of simply dissecting Blue Death X86. I love that he's called the meat puppets as well on this one. So it's like another <laughs> derogatory term for humans. I love it. Is that, a, is that a band, the meat puppets? I believe it is. I think it is, but the ninja meat puppets or pathetic ninja meat puppets should be a band. That would be the full force cast. Oh God, yeah. Doing cover versions of the meat puppets. We, and we have said that we are going to do some sort of hideous karaoke thing which we should definitely do <laughs> and then obviously we're also getting in this battle bn bnx0066 is still kind of hanging around watching and observing and he's got his head poked through the hatch just to see like what just to kind of observe what's happening and basically the clan are just taking him to pieces but then raymond dis- decides to kind of like you know, just before Dawn is almost kind of destroyed by the the droid who kind of gets the uh, the, the the kind of one up on her, Raymond jumps in to kind of sacrifice himself and does take a hit to the arm, but what that does then is show the droid who's on who's observing that oh my mom, you know I I can't believe he he sacrificed himself to help another, and that's where this you know more information about you know this upgrade that this droid has had starts to kind of come to to the forefront a little bit he has he's developed like empathy for the ninja for the arashikage clan you know and that act of of kind of self-sacrifice by raymond even though he survives bnx 0066 uh, is like he just he is he's in almost an awe that someone would actually do that for a fellow colleague so larry's done a nice job of, of making this droid into a real character over the course of this story that has kind of you know very quickly developed from a droid following orders to a droid trying desperately trying to resolve things under pressure to go you know almost like a 180 degree turn and he's now sympathetic to the humans and almost and as we're going to find out he's, he basically takes their side at that at the end of this struggle i noticed that um he's his name switches to bnz 0066 at this stage as well i'm not sure if that was if that's a type, I'm thinking it's a typo, or the first one is a typo. So at some point, it's either BNZ or BNX. That's Neil Yataki getting as confused with these names as we are. Exactly. That's 100%. Or, or it's because he's been upgraded to a human um, skin upgrade, so he changes <laughs> from X to Z. But uh, no, I think that's a, a typo. The problem is, I don't know which one's the typo. So your guess is as good as mine, guys, as to what the name of this f-ing droid is. Uh, in any case, like Brian just mentioned, the droid decides that just before they, you know, obviously just before the Arashikagi kind of win and Storm Shadow lops its head off, um, it's going to go into self-destruct mode. Or that's what the spider droid says. And he says to, and he kind of mentions to BNX or BNZ, depending on which typo you go with, he says, we're going to self-destruct, get clear, or don't, I don't really give a sh- <laughs> because you know we can we can we can always make more of you idiots and he kind of says at that point no it's not i'm not going to let this happen grabs the droid um by the leg pulls it clear of the of the clan and it blows up in in midair taking out both droids and that leaves the clan going what the f- was that all about and then we have dawn tending to raymond's wound and he's ba- basically saying i don't care what granny says I would sacrifice myself again if, if need be. He's going to do that, which I thought was a nice touch to end that particular story. Makings of a love story there, going to kick off. Mm, possibly. Although I'm, I would be more intrigued, or I could see Helix and Dawn 
having some sort of romantic entanglement because you know how we've been like watching the silent option you know the fact that helix has got that connection with snake eyes already and the fact that snake eyes is effectively part of dawn in some way shape or form i could see that blossoming do you know what i mean like i could see that you're onto something there well i'm gonna call it now because i think that would be a really interesting and then obviously very progressive for gi joe kind of uh, plot twist and then i'm gonna go out on a limb and say that uh, raymond falls in love with don but because she does not return those affections <sighs> jealousy evil. eats him up and consumes him and he becomes a bad guy oh my god what an awesome story why are we not writing the comic i'm kidding larry <laughs> if you're listening there we go we've just spoiled all of your story for the next 16 months what did you think before we get onto the backup story brian what did you think overall of this particular issue i really enjoyed it i mean this is it's it's a one shot but it ties back in nicely with the setup in issue 259 of real american hero yeah and i think we're getting an introduction to some some new characters at least in the form of raymond uh and that even within the revanche droid makeup that there can be you know, there can be some characters, some droids now who can go rogue. Yeah. Which we see happen here at, at the end with uh, BNX0066. So. Or BNZ. Or BNZ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so I really enjoyed it. It's, it's a standalone piece. You could pick this up, not know anything about the, the, the continuity, and, and just really enjoy the story. And of course, the artwork is top notch top-notch throughout um, and some nice action i agree and in actual fact i've got to say i wasn't that crazy about it when i first read it what i tend to have i I have expectations for some things and when i'm told that something's you know you're going to get this or there's going to be a story about this you know your expectations run a bit wild and obviously this was something completely different to what i'd expected but having read it maybe two or three and, and this is the thing i've gone back and i've read it and i've enjoyed it again and again and again and the the more I look at it, the more I study it, the more I read it, the more I get from it. And this particular um, story I really, really love. And I think a lot of that has to do with the art because, my goodness, Kay Zama is just awesome. And yeah, she is definitely going to have to have her own book like because this is just next level kind of stuff. And she tells a really solid story with her artwork as well totally agree on that this is one of these issues where well there are sections of it that have a lot lot of kind of dialogue between characters for the most part there's or maybe not for the most part but there's also key scenes where the visuals tell the story without a yeah. reliance on on speech bubbles to explain what's going on it's almost like a silent issue homage isn't it in in places especially when we have our kind of arashikage guys when it, the focus is just on them, it's brilliantly done. And, of course, for the action sequences, too. it's uh, All around, I think this particular story is top-notch. Yeah, same. And then, obviously, we get this incredible backup strip, which is something that I think has been hinted at for, for quite some time. We got a little bit of a heads-up with a description of what we what to expect in this backup story a few months ago and it's really it's it's a fun little thing so basically what we see in the backup strip is a focus on duke and him in his coma from the end of the movie gi joe uh sorry action force the movie (laughs) Um, (laughs) from you know the, the the animated sunbow series and it basically takes up from the back end of that so what we have is duke in a coma going through these kind of really intense dreams, uh, seeing Globulus at the start, clearly, seeing Serpentor on the back of one of those huge, like, cobra la flying... It was the one that picks up the BET in the movie, but yeah, this huge... It's almost like a spider with wings, huge crab spider with wings, and that doesn't make any sense. You can also see the worms in the background, the marauders. He calls them marauders. <sighs> So these big kind of worm marauders that make the worst sound in the world. It's like this... Put that in there as well. And you've also got, like, in the bottom right-hand corner of that panel, you can see one of the other Cobra La creatures that I think was possibly a bridge or something along those lines Ooh, yeah. that, that, that Sergeant Summer smacks with his gun and then it kind of collapses again, like, back to a, back to being a bridge. And then you have basically duke flying out of his coma because he sees the snakes coming at him just like when uh, serpentor threw one at him in the film and there he is kind of like screaming cobra and 
we're in like a room we're in duke's bedroom by the looks of things with snake or maybe even like a you know scarlet or snake eyes place with scarlet and snake eyes looking after him this depot looks like i would say scarlet and snake eyes is cabin oh yeah probably maybe yeah more, uh, more than likely. It's, it's definitely not like a proper medic you think it might be a medical ward in that kind of initial panel when duke jumps up because you can see obviously the drip machine and stuff you know that's hooked up to him but the image pans back things like a shotgun hanging on the wall what looks like kind of family photos some medals in a frame and then obviously a wheelchair off to the side so it's a uh, yeah definitely a domestic residence for sure i think it might be duke's place uh just out i, I don't know it, it could either be duke's place like you say or snake eyes and scarlet's place because it just has yeah you're right it has that residential vibe doesn't it but then obviously that's when we're introduced to what this story is going to be called and it's a prologue for an ongoing which sounds brilliant called infinite cobra so uh, you know again i'm already interested because i'm thinking okay so we're going to get something from this this is not just a backup story this is going to be a series and it's going to be separate from the a real american hero run obviously because it's a different continuity but then we get scarlet contacting falcon who is obviously duke's half brother in the uh, film and she's basically saying falcon you need to be here we need you to come and visit him and all this kind of stuff and falcon's saying we've got serpentor on the run because he escaped in the film we've chased him to this particular place we can't let up now uh, and then he says like you know I'll, I'll call you soon to you know when, when when it's when we kind of catch him or whatever and they cut out, the feed cuts out, so he gets angry and he breaks the laptop because that's what Falcon does. And in also in that panel, we get to see a couple of G.I. Joe vehicles in the background. We see the Havoc and we see the Vamp, which I think is a really nice touch. Yes, that's lovely. And in fact, we were talking about vehicles only yesterday, it seems. And we get some, yay. And we, and we got some, yeah. <laughs> and then we're taken elsewhere. And again, this is, a, this is only like a three-pager uh, I think, or four pages. It's a very, very short story. But on the final page, we see what is, I would imagine, the Himalayas and where Cobra La was before the huge explosion. And you get this figure appear at the top of some stairs, like all cloaked up. Like all these skulls and stuff like adorn the, the stairway, which is really scary. And then at the bottom of all of this lump of... <laughs> human not human but like cobra la bits and pieces possibly human bits is this uh, the remains of uh nemesis enforcer yes. who has on him this kind of like gem or an emerald as part of the <laughs> i'm not sure if it's like part of the same gemstone that she gives zartan in the movie and he's like a gem of this size answers all my questions but <laughs> I'm not sure if that's like from the same family of of, em- of gems, but for some reason she's gone for that and taken it off the dead body of Nemesis Enforcer. And you can tell it's him because of the colour of the clothing that's left on him, the, the big wing bones, which is kind of gross. Uh, and it's also quite, I, I find that quite sad. It's like, oh no, we've you know ne- there's no more Nemesis Enforcer now in the uh, in this particular continuity, but that's what the last scene is basically pythona holding that piece of gem and it's like oh and then it says to be continued in gi joe infinite cobra so we are getting a story out of this are you excited about this brian oh i am so excited about it i love that this picks up immediately after the events in the movie which is which is fantastic but when i first read this it reminded me of Citizens Cancelled series, which I think ended with um, one of the Joe team having a dream about uh, Cobra La. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I can't wait for this. I've been wanting... I know it's not like necessarily Sunbow animated art style, which I was hoping for, but at the same time, it's the story and it follows that that kind of continuity. So I'm excited to see what they do with it. This, I'll definitely be picking this up. Again, really excited. Love the colours. You know, the, the colour palette in this, very different from the, the previous story in the yearbook. They've got these kind of you know brighter pinks, brighter greens, a bit more kind of fluorescent or neon uh, to some degree. And have that sort of dream sequence and when Duke wakes up. So that's... 
that in and of itself has a very kind of retro kind of vibe to it. So yeah, re- really looking forward to G.I. Joe Infinite Cobra. And it's probably, obviously it's worth us mentioning that Tommy Lee Edwards is the writer on this particular backup story and with art by uh, David Gianfelice, which again, like I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a good combo, I think, uh, just initially in this backup story. I'm very, very intrigued to, to see where it goes. And I loved all of the, the the bits they're putting in there, like the spores, uh, which is the first, in actual fact, the first panel that I failed to mention. But you've got the spore there, which obviously uh, they, they were kind of burnt up in space and didn't cause the huge regression of the human race that their Cobra La wanted it to. You've got Globulus in there. You've got, behind him, you've got those kind of like living vines, which basically trapped loads of the Joes during the battle of Cobra La. You've got all of the different creatures with Serpentor standing on the back of the one that picked up the BET in the in the film and the Marauders worms and the and the bridge kind of friggin' mantis or whatever it is. You've got the snakes that Serpentor threw at, at Duke, his coma. I mean everything is being homaged here. And then obviously you've got Falcon and the Joes on location. You've got the Himalayas and the and the scene of the of the of where Cobra La used to be. You've got Nemesis and Forza. You've got the gem. You've got Pythona. Everything in this and the vamp. Four pages. Four pages, and to get all of that reference in, that is Mental. genius. Yeah, totally. I'm. There's probably stuff I'm even missing. There's probably some stuff in there that I'm not even picking up on, but. It's just, I, I just think it's great. I will just throw in there that, in the, I think it was the late 90s, maybe in the noughties, there was a, a run of Star Wars books, about 19 of them, that featured a bad guy in a cult, the Yuzan Vong. Oh, and the Yuzan yeah. Vong, what was key about them was that they didn't use any machinery. All of their weapons and vehicles Bio. were living organisms. Yeah, yeah. Completely ripped off globulus and cobra la it did you know i i I remember that vividly because i was kind of that was i was reading the comics constantly at that stage and you know i was getting all the star wars comics every single different iteration of it and the yuzan vong were in it quite often and there was an entire storyline where one of the they kind of like invade a home planet and the people there kind of you know kind of like fight back but one of them gets into the one of the ships but to to pilot it it kind of takes over half her body and she's basically on the turn, but she kind of sacrifices herself to save her planet, basically. I actually have those comics. I just can't remember the name of that series, but that was a great series. Was, I mean, it was in um, it was in dark times, wasn't it, as well? that The Yuuzhan Vong were in dark times quite often. They were in tales every now and again. But yeah, the, the, in the specific story, I forget what it's called as well, but I was loving that, that series. I was loving the, the Star Wars comics, but it just got to the point where I think they ran out of... It just got... I think... I, I got bored with it. I did actually get bored with it. The, and the soap opera ran out of steam. It kind of did. <laughs> but yeah, but I'm, I I was... I don't know. I just... I loved Quinlan Voss. I was such a fan of him. I loved Cade Skywalker storyline with yes. Delilah Blue and, and that kind of crew. I really loved the those kind of stories and those... Going to have to do another Star Wars comics burst and, and look back at some of this stuff. <laughs> Oh man, there's so much to there's so much to discuss with this stuff. It just gets ridiculous. But anyway, coming back to the yearbook, Brian, what would you give it overall as a? And actually, it should actually I should mention just before we give it the the ratings, we also do get like a big overview, a written kind of text overview of what we've had with the Dawn storyline as well. So. Um, that does actually get included as well. So there's almost like a three part of this this book, isn't it? it is, and actually, I haven't read that. This really nice, I'm going to say essays. Probably essays probably not doing it justice, but it's not really a graphic piece. It's it's a text piece, but it brings us kind of up to speed on the you know the dawn of Snake Eyes or Don Moreno. And um, looking forward to having a read of that later today when I get a chance. But overall, I think this is a great buy. Delighted I picked it up. And if we're diving into potatoes. This is all out five potatoes for me. <laughs> I um, I must admit I it, it's grown on me a lot, and I love the Cobra La backup story. I'm so it's making me excited for what's to come as well. I mean, we're going to have Silent Options going to be finishing soon, but you know if we can get another little side story with the Infinite Cobra, which I don't think is going to be like a it's not going to be an ongoing that keeps going and going. I think they're going to just do a. Um, like a, a short series of it initially but the more they can get out of that the better if we can get like 12 issues then great i don't know what it's going to be but 
if we could get like a 12 issue run and if it's successful i suppose i'll keep doing it but you know that that that's something i'm really excited for and in terms of the other story i was yeah it grew on me massively and and kay zama's art's just beautiful i just want to see her on everything so yeah it has to be up there i'm gonna go four and a half because i can't <laughs> i can't be brian hickey all the time we, we've got one brian hickey we can't have two brian hickeys <laughs> you know I'm, I'm usually the guy in the middle with paddy giving things one and you giving things 12 i'll be the guy in the middle on this one and i'm gonna say four and a half but it's an absolute stunner loved it from start to finish get it if you haven't got it go for it brian thank you for jumping on mate and uh, discussing the yearbook with me i loved it absolutely loved it and happy happy to do this every single time <laughs> brilliant that's it for this installment of the full force comics burst thank you to my awesome co-host brian hickey see you next time and as always full force full force Make sure you get involved with the discussion by liking, sharing and commenting on these videos and as always you can keep up with the show after listening by following on Twitter at The Full Force, liking the Facebook page facebook.com slash The Full Force and if you would like to contact the show you can message us on either of those platforms with feedback, questions or just a troll. Look out for more of these comic bursts on Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, our Facebook page, Twitter feed and YouTube channel from now on. Full Force. And a big shout out to our sponsors, Distant Planet Comics and Collectibles, located at 601 Business Loop 70 West Suite 263, located in the Parkade Centre, Columbia, Missouri. You can visit their website at distantplanetcomics.com and on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash distantplanetcomics.